Welcome back to Mr. Mix Classroom. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over uh, some sample questions. So basically, we've been doing the Part 107 um, study. So this is if you want to get your drone license. And uh, that's what this series has been about lately. And today, I just want to go through some sample questions with you and answer the sample questions. Um, if you have questions on any of the questions or answers, just leave a comment uh, in the comments below, and then I'll, I'll make a follow-up video or I'll answer it in the comments. Um, but uh, without further ado, let's get started with that. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen here and uh, students. So in case you don't know, I'm a drone technology teacher at a high school. And, um, and so I use a lot of these videos for my students, but a lot of people who aren't my students use them too to help pass the uh, FAA Part 107 um, unmanned aircraft exam. So uh, today I just want to try to get through maybe 10 to 15 video or questions just so this video isn't too long. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with that. And again, if you have any questions on these, leave a comment below. Um, let's start off with this first one here. I think this is an important question uh, just because I want to discuss some things not entirely related to the question, but related to CTAF. So here it says, what is the definition of CTAF? And um, the answer here is it's an air-to-air -air communication system for pilots to communicate with each other. So what CTAF is, it's a radio frequency that pilots use when they're landing in an airport that does not have a control tower. So if there's a control tower, then the control tower is going to radio to the aircraft and they're going to tell them if it's okay to land or if it's okay to take off or what runway they're going to land on or they're going to tell them what they need to do. If there's no control tower, well, pilots need a way to communicate to each other so they don't run into each other when they're trying to land or take off. So they'll use CTAF to let other pilots know that they're getting ready to land. Um, just a little side note. So right here, this is, the, uh, this is the testing supplement. This is the book you'll get when you go to take the exam. So they're gonna hand you a book. It looks just like this PDF. Um, I'll leave this link to this PDF here in the, um, in the description below so you can use this. You will need this to study and you'll need this to answer practice tests. Um, when you get this on the exam, I want you to know that uh, you have access to this uh, this legend here. So this is the sectional chart legend. Um, and if you ever if you have a sectional chart map, so what pilots use to see where they can fly and where airspace is, um, this is on there. And so this is on the test, and you can access this at any time during the test. So if it asks you, say, what the acronym CTAF stands for, and say you have no clue, you're like, I don't know what CTAF stands for, um, you can come over here and you'll see this little C with the circle. That's your CTAF icon. On the map, if you're looking at an airport, it's going to give you this description here of what's going on with that airport. Right here is that C icon. And so it's telling you this number, this 118.3, that's the CTAF for this airport. So here, if it ever asks you what CTAF stand for and you don't know, you can always look right here and you can say, you can see it stands for Common Traffic Advisory Frequency, CTAF. Boom. So it answers that right there for you. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. There are answers in the legend on the, that will answer test questions. You can use this during the test. Make sure you know that this is available to you for the test. Uh, next question. Um, I'm going to go over this one too. I'm not going to go over all these, but this one is an easy one that you should be getting 100% of the time. So what is the Unicom frequency for the Pier Regional Airport? So it's telling you go to figure 77. So again, you'll open your, your testing supplement here. So your test book. Um, and let me fit, flip this back around. What I find instead of trying to scroll through all these, I like to click on con content. Uh, so you get the table of contents and then go down to the figure. So it said figure 77 and click on it that way. It opens it way quicker. This is a huge PDF with 113 pages on it. So if you try to scroll through 77 pages, it's going to take you a long time. All right. We're looking for the Unicom frequency. This is another radio that pilots use. Um, and all you need to find is the channel. When you see something like this, don't panic. This is an easy question. You just got to read through here. Take your time. There's a ton of time on the test. Take your time. Read through each line until you see Unicom. All you're looking for is a number for Unicom. So read through here and eventually you'll get down here and you'll see Unicom. And then for this airport, for the uh, Pierre Regional Airport, the Unicom is 122.95. This is obviously a different airport right here, right? Um, so the, the Pierre is 122.95. And then I see that as the answer choice and that's the correct answer. Um, 
I'm not going to go through this one right now. I'll, I'll give you a quick and dirty way to do it, but I have another video that's air traffic air traffic patterns. If you want to see how to do these problems, I go through those in depth there. But simply this one's uh, pilot announces left downwind for runway 26. Well, and then it's asking what direction the aircraft's heading in. So if they're going for 26, that's 260. So if it's uh, over 180, we just want a minus 180 out here. So therefore, uh, the heading is going to be 80 degrees because I know it's the exact opposite of 260. If you need more information on that, please watch my video that says air, uh, air traffic patterns and we'll give you in-depth explanation on these questions. These questions are easy for you once you know how to do them. They're hard for people when they don't know how to do them, but they're really easy for people once they know how to do them. <clears throat> what must be displayed on the UAV during a flight mission? Um, you have to display your, sorry, I was going through these yesterday. Um, uh, so you have to display your registration number. Don't let that get confused with the FCC registration number. FCC is the Federal Communications Commission. They do not regulate airlines. The FAA is what air regulates aircraft and drones and anything else that flies in the sky. So you have to have your registration number on your drone if your drone weighs more than 0.55 pounds. If it doesn't weigh more than 0.55 pounds, you don't need a registration number. But if it does, you have to have it on the drone. Um, getting in a state of overbreathing where you are exhaling more than you are inhaling is known as hyperventilation. Hyper, the prefix here, is too much, or hypo is not enough. Think of O is below. O is below. So you're overbreathing. So too much breathing. So it's hyperventilation. Ventilation is breathing, right? If uh, we were talking about being too hot or cold, hypothermia is where you're too cold, right? O is below. So you're overbreathing, hyperventilation. Which is the correct traffic pattern departure procedure to use in a non-towered airport, meaning there's no controlled tower? The answer is whatever the FAA says it is. So comply with any FAA traffic pattern established for the airport. This is one of those tricky questions. The FAA loves making tricky questions. Basically, that's what they do is they just set tr tricks and traps for you in this entire test. And you need to know how to avoid those tri tricks. This right here is a trick question. It's not even a wrong answer. Um, well, it's kind of wrong, but it's, it's not a bad answer. Make all, turn, uh, make all turns to the left. So normally when an aircraft is landing or, or circling an airport, they are making left-hand turns. Um, but that's not always. You know, normally or usually or most of the time is not the same as saying always. So make all left turns. The other thing is, if there's an airport where the FAA says make right-hand turns, then you comply with that. You make right-hand turns. So um, just be aware of that. Uh, don't get tricked up by this. Yes, normally, and that could be a question in a different, uh, that could be an answer to a different question. Um, what direction do pilots normally turn in when, or aircraft normally turn in when circling an airport? They usually make left turns, but you're supposed to do whatever the FAA says to do. Which aircraft has the right of way over all other air traffic? An aircraft in distress. During a flight of your small UA, you observe a hot air balloon entering the area. You should yield the right of way. So as a drone pilot, you're yielding the right of way to everyone else. Uh, refer to figure 20. Okay, so yeah, we should have unmarked these. I can't like unclick them. Uh, sorry, I went through these yesterday, but... Um, Okay, well, let's go to figure 20 and we're looking for this NFE airport and we wanna figure out what airspace it is. So again, I'm just gonna click on contents rather, try and, rather than trying to scroll all the way up. There's figure 20. So that's gonna take me over to figure 20. Um, this is the Norfolk, uh, Virginia Beach area. Um, I saw this on my test multiple times. So I do think there's certain maps you'll see on the test um, more than others. Uh, for example, I also saw Dallas, Fort Worth on the test like five times. Um, right here is that NFE airport. It's really hard to see. The hard thing with this one is just trying to find the NFE airport. What I like to do is look for the ticker symbol, that NFE. It's always going to be at the end in parentheses there. Um, like JFK, John F. Kennedy Airport's called JFK. Raleigh Airport's called RDU. So, uh, you know, use that. 
once you find it, it's not so bad. The hard thing with, you know, airspaces like this is there's a bunch of airports, as you can see, airport, 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 or landing strip, um, airport, 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 airport. So you got to find it. Once you find it, then we see a dash magenta line. Dash magenta is class E. That's the answer to this question, class echo airspace. All right, here's one I'm more going to talk about testing strategy. This is less about the question, more about strategy. So here it says sigmets are issued as a warning of weather conditions hazardous to which aircraft. Let's say you have no clue where the sigmet is and you see this question. What I find, and I'm not saying this is 100% of the time, but 95, most of the time, let me just say most of the time, most of the time when I'm answering practice questions for the FAA Part 107 exam, if they have an all option or a both A and B option, it's usually that. I, I actually haven't seen any questions where they have an all option or both A and B option, and that's not the correct answer. It's usually all, like all of the above or A and B when that's a choice. Now, if you have reason to believe that it's only small aircraft, right, or it's only large aircraft, right, or it's not the both, uh, or it's not the all option, then pick that. Don't go with, oh, Mr. Mig said do you, that it's always all if you see all. No, no, no. I said, usually that's what I see. And if you have no clue, go with that. Like, if you see this and you're like, I don't know what a Sigma is, Go with all aircrafts then. I, in this case, that is the correct answer here. Um, but I just find most of the time, if that's an option, it's usually the right answer. And if you have no clue, go with that as a guess and move on. Um, let's see. Let's move on. I want to hit some certain ones. I'm going to skip that one for right now. I'm going to skip this one. This is outdated, so I'm going to skip this, and I'm going to come back to that in a different video. Um, Figure 24, area three, I want to hit a lot of the map ones. What are what other aviation activity can you expect near the Tri-County Airport? So let's go to figure 24. Again, I'm just going to click on my contents and scroll down to 24. And unfortunately, I'm going to flip this map. The one thing is because this PDF is so large, it just takes so long to, um, uh, to get these. So area to get these right. So... It takes a long for it to update. Okay, here's the Tri-County Airport. Um, and then we see, so it's asking, what other aviation activity can you expect in that area there? Um, right here, you see a parachute. So there's going to be parachute jumpers. And that could be important for you to know as a drone pilot. You don't want to run your drone into a parachuter. Um, so again, that's what that parachute symbol looks like right there. It's a parachute. So there's going to be skydiving going on there. All right, moving on. When loading cameras on other payload or other payloads on your SUAS, the remote PIC should mount and inspect the items in a manner that um, that does not adversely affect the center of gravity. That is the correct answer here. So you want to be careful when you're loading anything onto your UA that you're not going to throw off the center of gravity because that's going to obviously cause problems with it having lift. Uh, let's see. Okay. I'm going to, I'm not even going to go to the figure here. Sometimes they'll give you a question where it says refer to the figure 80 and you don't even need it. This one, uh, it's debatable whether you need it, but, uh, again, some just test taking advice here. Uh, what's the minimum visibility required at the area surrounding the Crawford airport? Okay. When you're flying a drone, the minimum visibility is three statute miles. It, even if you're in an area where for manned aircraft, it's only one statute mile, right? you're required to have three statute miles of visibility when you're flying a drone. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be able to see your DJI Mini three miles away. Obviously, you're not going to be able to see the DJI Mini. They're like this big and they're, the, you know, they're hard to see. You're not going to see it three miles away. That's not what that means by three statute miles of visibility. It means you can see three miles. So it means if there was an airplane on the horizon or if there's a tower in the horizon that's three miles away, you could see it. Some days, if it's cloudy or rainy or foggy, you can only see, you can't see three miles away. If you can't have at least three miles of visibility where you can see three miles away or more, then you're not allowed to fly your drone. So whenever it's asking a question, you're going to fly your drone at this airport, what's the minimum visibility? For a drone, it's always three statute miles. Now, this question didn't say anything about a drone. It said just what's the minimum visibility required at the airport surrounding, or at the, uh, in the area surrounding Crawford Airport. What I find, now there could be times for man pilots where the answer is not three statute miles, but what I find 
is for these questions, every time I've seen a practice question for these, the answer is always three statute miles, even if it doesn't say a drone. There are other times where like for manned aircraft or in certain airports where it's not three statute miles, it'd be one statute mile or five statute miles. But from what I see, if you're confused and you're not sure, just go with three statute miles. Um, all of the questions I've seen that ask about visibility at airports go to that because that's what you need to fly a drone is the three statute miles. Now, I'm not saying there might not be one on the test. That's not that. That's not talking about drones. It's talking about manned aircraft. And so it could be something different. But if you're unsure, I would go with three statute miles. That's what I would do. According to some law, um, a SUAS is an unmanned aircraft system weighing less than 55 pounds. This is what I mean by the FAA liking to set tricks and traps. This is such like a mean question. We know that uh, our Part 107 license gives us the right to fly anything, um, well, really anything under 55 pounds. But for it to be registered, it has to be between 0.55 pounds and 55 pounds. Those two numbers are important. Uh, What's tricky is, is it 50, is it less than 55 pounds or is it 55 pounds or less? It's less than 55 pounds in this case. Um, if it's 55 pounds, your part 107 license does not qualify you to fly it. It's too heavy. If it's 54 pounds and, you know, five ounces, you can fly it. Uh, let's see, we already talked about this required visibility. Um, time critical information on airports and changes that affect the nation's airspace are provided by. Okay, so this is NOTAM, so notice to airmen. So say the president's in an area, the FAA might send out a NOTAM telling all aircraft, hey, don't fly here. Here's a temporary flight restriction uh, due to that. Or maybe if there's an air show, they'll put in a temporary flight restriction. So that's what NOTAMs are. And just as a side note, you can check them at 1-800-WX-BRIEF.COM is what it will say. Um, and I know that sounds like a, like a bogus website, but that's what it is. So NOTAMs are notice to airmen and they are there to provide, to block off airspace or put a temporary flight restriction um, when the FAA deems it necessary. Um, okay, here's a good one. When you're using a small UA in a commercial operation, who is responsible for briefing the participants about emergency procedures? Whenever it asks who's responsible, if it asks you who's responsible, and then whatever the situation is, it's almost always the remote pilot in command. And that's you, right? If you have the Part 107 license, you're the remote pilot in command, you're responsible. That person, the remote pilot in command, is almost always the answer to the who's responsible question for any of these questions. Uh, I'm gonna make this the last one here and then I'll close this video out and I'll do another video just so the videos aren't too long. Um, on the day you're planning to fly your UAV, remember drone, unmanned aircraft, UAV, UAS, SUAS, they're all the same thing. Uh, on the day you're going to fly your UAV, the temperature and dew point are both within 10, are both 10 degrees Celsius. What weather should you expect? Fog. The answer is fog. If the temperature and the dew point get within three to degrees of each other, then you are likely to have fog. All dew point means is the temperature at which the air is fully saturated, so with moisture. Um, so therefore, dew point can never be higher than the actual temperature because then the air would have more water in it than it can hold, but you can't do that. So when the dew point hits the temperature, you're going to get fog because that saturation has to come out eventually. And so that's what's happening there is you're going to get fog at when the temperature and the dew point are the same. And with when they're within three degrees of each other, you can expect a like, high likelihood of fog. Uh, if they're more than three degrees apart, then you're not as likely to see fog. Um, okay, well, that's the last one I wanted to hit. Yeah, I'll go over some more uh, in a different video. So thank you for watching Mr. M Mr. Mig's Classroom. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section below. Um, watch my other videos uh, that I'm going to post on these and so we can go through more of these because I'm telling you just repeti repetition on doing these questions, going through these questions helps a lot for passing this FAA Part 107 exam. Uh, yeah, hit a, give me a thumbs up and throw some comments in the comment section if you have any questions. I will see you next time. Thank you for watching.